So today is our first Sunday World Religions Focus, and it's on the Orthodox Christian Church. Um, this is the, our next step in the development of religious thought in human history. One of the things that I find interesting is how little we all learn about traditions that are different from our own but have really historically influenced the faith traditions that we grew up in. So it would be difficult to talk about the Orthodox Church without addressing the tensions in the early Christian church that brought about the split between the Western and the Eastern churches. So today we're focusing on the Orthodox Church, which is the, East, the Christian church in the East. So there's the Greek Orthodox, Bulgarian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox, and other different Orthodox um, beliefs. Each of these branches of the Orthodox Church have been influenced by the cultures and the history of the countries in which uh, they thrived. Some beliefs in the Orthodox Church, Christian Church, are similar to the Roman Catholic Church and others are radically different. Um, one of the things that I've found very interesting that in the last few years several people have said to me is, well, you know Catholics aren't Christian. You know, these were like some Protestants, maybe evangelicals, and it just points out how little we know about our heritage. And so I wanted to say, well, where did you think your faith tradition came from? But I was, I didn't do that. But, you know, because we all, I mean, we, if we grew, grow up in a faith tradition, we, um, we are taught sort of our party line, and then that's it. So how and why did the believers in Jesus split into such different paths? In reality, the Christian church, both Roman and Orthodox, were unified for 10 centuries. Though because of political and cultural differences um, that developed long before the official break in 1064, you know, for, I mean, a thousand years is a long time to be friendly with each other. Prior to the split, there had been incredible Increasing isolation between the Latin scholarly culture in the West and the Greek culture of the Byzantine Empire. And there's still some contentious theological differences between the Western and Eastern Church, although with this new Pope, he's really working on closer dialogue uh, within the Christian family. So without going into too much history, by the third century, the Christian faith had expanded enough, you know, and let's face it, we didn't have rapid transit or airports back then, and when you're spread all over that part of the world, there was the Western Church and then the Eastern or Byzantine. And over the years, um, because the two groups spoke different languages, Latin, Greek, there was growing um, misunderstanding just because of the linguistic differences and the worldview differences that came with those languages. So during the first centuries of the church, all Christians in the East and West were united in their affirmation of the first seven ecumenical councils. The councils that are most important to our Unitarian Universalist history are Nicaea in 325 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451. And these councils were the ones that solidified the concept of the Trinity. Do not talk to traditional Christians about the fact that the Trinity was not doctrine 
until the fourth century. That's very disconcerting, but I talked to him about it anyway. Um, so um, until that time, you know, the thread of belief in the unity of God was still very active in the early tr- Christian church. And then, of course, you had Origen, who was one of the early church fathers in the East, who believed in universal salvation. And as Christian doctrine got tighter, he then was designated a heretic and no more universal salvation. But what this means is that Unitarian and universal thought, though valid in the early Christian church, were rejected as heretical by the fourth century. So since the word heretic simply means to doubt, We modern Unitarian Universalists continue to be people who grapple with ideas that are outside traditional religious thinking. There are also um, important areas of of agreement between the East and West churches um, that continue to this day, such as the divine and human nature of Jesus, apostolic succession, though not the East and the West are somewhat different. The focus on the sinless life of the Virgin Mary. Now, when I was in high school, this is a question. How many of us who may have grown up in the traditional Christian church read ahead in the Apostles' Creed and left out born of the Virgin Mary? Did anybody else do that? Okay, there are a few. I'm not the only weird person. Uh, But there's this real honoring of Mary, and especially in the Orthodox Church, is the Theotokos, the bearer of God, um, which, of course, we can see in other Eastern religions, even in Egyptian um, mythology. So both traditions accept seven sacraments, confession, and the celebration of the Eucharist as the sacrifice of Jesus. And both the East and the West believe in transubstantiation, which means they believe that once the the bread and wine are blessed, they become literally the blood and body of Jesus. There are many theological, linguistic, and ritualistic differences, and most prominent is different views about papal succession. Now, the Orthodox Church focuses its theology on the authority of Scripture and holy tradition. So it doesn't believe that any one bishop is superior over any other bishop. To them, every bishop represents St. Peter on earth. So there's no earthly head uh, of the Orthodox Church that is comparable to the Pope. The highest ranking bishop of the communion is the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, who's also the head or primate of one of the other branches of the Orthodox Church, like the Russian Orthodox or Syrian Orthodox. He is the first among equals. So there's this rejection of the extreme hierarchy that is found in the West. Um, So no Orthodox churches or priests consider themselves um, subject to any papal rulings. There are many traditions that shaped the Orthodox Christian Church, and one that people usually think of when you think of um, Orthodox Christianity is the use of icons for prayer and contemplation. And um, I brought some of my own icons that as a Unitarian Universalist I use for prayer and contemplation. Um, 
And there's always been a lot of controversy about icons, the belief that people are worshipping idols or worshipping that icon. But to the Orthodox Church, they are merely a teaching tool and um, a, a matter of reflection but not worship. Um, which is sort of interesting because, you know, with the Eastern Church really being into icons, um, and, it, and it was there where Islam began to expand. Like in Islam, there are no human images. So this would be a real tension between uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church and how Islam developed. One very focused on images as a way to connect to the sacred, and the other having images be anathema. Although I find it really interesting, and Paula um, helped um, teach me about some of this. Perhaps the most beautiful Eastern Orthodox Church um, in the Eastern. Uh, church is the Hagia Sophia Mosque in Istanbul. So you've visited there. Some of us may have. And um, Jesus and especially Mary were quite revered in in Islam. And when the Ottoman Empire conquered that part of the Orthodox uh, reign. They turned the Hagia Sophia Cathedral into a mosque. However, they were so moved by the beauty of the icons and the mosaics in the church that they didn't destroy them. They did not tear them down. They plastered them over. So that centuries later, that plaster was able to be removed and the whole uh, building was made into a museum so that people visiting the study can see both their Orthodox and their Muslim or Ottoman heritage, which um, I think once again points to the history of interfaith understanding. Um, Gosh, I started talking, where am I? Okay, so um, one of the things that's very interesting about the icons that I learned from um, a Greek Orthodox priest I worked with in Georgia, and he's an iconographer, part-time priest, part-time iconographer. So what I find really fascinating is the way Orthodox churches are built. Because it's almost like from the very top of the dome, if there's a dome, it's like that is where symbols of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reside. And as you come down, it really is a teaching tool about creation and the cosmos. As you come down, you have saints, you have angels, you have the prophets. And then moving down, there are always icons of the saint for which the church is named and very often um, more local leaders, historic leaders within that community or that church. And so you can imagine centuries ago when not very many people were literate that they really could go into this peaceful place and centuries ago and a lot of old um, cathedrals don't have electricity. So you go in and there's this magnificent art that helps you connect with the cosmos, the world, and the history of um, your church. Um, one of the interesting things about how Orthodox people uh, historically have uh, worshipped is that they feel that their buildings, their sacred spaces, are a direct uh, extension of their Jewish roots. 
the practice is continued that men and women stand or now in more modern churches sit separately. Um, and with this arrangement, it's emphasized that both men and women are equidistant to the priest and the sacraments, that there is no hierarchy between men and women. And it's interesting because if we go to our churches in Transylvania, the men and women sit on opposite sides. The pulpit is in the middle, the communion table is in the middle, but there's this equidistance and I'm sure that it ties back to their influence um, by, uh, of orthodoxy, which was um, uh, very influential in that part of Eastern Europe. So um, another question that sometimes I've asked, and maybe you've asked, is why are Easter and Christmas on different days in the Western and Eastern churches? Uh, why is uh, why is Christmas on January the seventh? Kids are already back in school. Well, the mo in in that's one of the key differences. The Orthodox Church uh, follows the Julian calendar, and the Catholic Church adheres to the Gregorian calendar. So, because they use different calendars there are different dates for holidays and feasts. So Julius Caesar uh, amended the old Roman calendar and made the Julian calendar in 46 BC. And um, the Julian calendar added an extra day to make our year 365 days. And because the earth takes an extra six, this is an orthodox Christianity, but I think it's cool. So um, because the earth takes an extra six hours uh, in addition to the 365 days to orbit the sun, Caesar added a leap year, resulting in a more accurate calendar. So as I said, orthodox churches kept the Julian calendar. However, in the West, Pope Gregory XIV reformed the Julian calendar in 1582 when he realized that Easter had drifted 10 days away from its initially agreed upon date at the Council of Nicaea in 325. So he, in that year, reset the calendar by 10 days to catch up with the original date. That must have been very confusing that year. So as we know, we follow the um, Gregorian calendar. So another question you might ask is, can Orthodox priests marry? Well, until the fourth century, Roman Catholic and Orthodox priests could marry. Um, and it wasn't until then that the issue of celibacy really became a major issue. Today, Orthodox priests can marry before ordination, and about 90% of Orthodox priests are uh, married. But bishops have to remain celibate probably because of their work schedule. I don't know. <laughs> um, in the Roman Catholic Church today, there has been a shift because if you are a married Episcopal priest converting to Roman Catholicism, you can remain married. So there are um, about 200, maybe more now, married Episcopal priests who are also Roman Catholic priests. So I think this is, you know, like a little chip in the in the armor. Um, so one of the big issues is that the Eastern Church has historically been centered in the Greek language. And in the early days, um, some Christian writings were in Greek, but over the centuries, 
Latin started being used in the Western Church and Greek in the Eastern Church, and that created problems if there were bad translations. How many times in our communities do we talk about, well, you know, that's really not, if we go back to the original language, what was being said. So you can imagine in the early Christian church where you had a lot of illiteracy, a lot of people educated in the church, but um, imperfect translations. So the differences in language and worldview that arose during the early church brought about great misunderstanding and really were at the heart of the break in the East and the West. And I think, you know, if we compare that time to this, we have the same issues in our world today. Like theologians centuries ago, we in our time struggle with different meanings of word and language. Just look at the lens of language today and how people see through different lens. I mean, social media, television, we see polarization happening a lot of times because people don't understand. Yes, there are different values, but sometimes people just don't understand what different people mean by the definitions of words. So one of the, the um, differences in language that I find really interesting is that in the Western church, there, among many people, there's a belief that God should be feared. Did any of us grow up in a Christian church where we were told that you should fear God? Yeah, lots of us. In the Eastern church, there's this belief that one rests in God. And this week, Holly Ulbrich shared uh, a meditation by Richard Rohr where He says, the early Christian church set the foundation and ground for what we now call contemplation. The term meaning resting in God applies to this primary concern in the Eastern church. They are, if we could describe them this way, the Buddhists of Christianity. The Western Church, however, was always missionary-oriented, practical, and focused on academic learning. The Eastern Church never got into the kind of scholasticism. It focused more on mysticism. How can we connect with God? And if God is experienced in creation and in the earth and everything... There's much more availability. There's not this, someone is going to tell me how I'm supposed to relate to God or the sacred, however we name that. And so in a lot of ways, that approach to spirituality might feel much more comfortable for Unitarian Universalists. And War goes on to say that the early fathers believed in universal restoration. And that's pretty much escaped the Western Church. Most most Catholics and Protestants today would be shocked at their early belief (coughs) that salvation is cosmic and universal. Sounds familiar to us, doesn't it? (coughs) Sorry. So uh, in the Eastern Church, we find an aspect of universal salvation (coughs) that our forebears professed. And while both East and West had monastic traditions, the Church in the East stepped away from the papacy and extreme hierarchy in exchange for a focus on divine intelligence. with which humans can engage. So the challenges that the church experienced over the centuries can also be our challenges as we seek to build bridges between different faiths and different cultures. 
they experience misunderstandings because of language and different worldviews. We experience that too. So how might we look past the divisions that ended up splitting them apart and the divisions that we see created among religious communities to achieve better understanding? To effectively communicate we must realize that we are all different in the ways we perceive the world and use this understanding as a guide to our communication with others. So as Unitarian Universalists, let us discover ways to build bridges among and between those of differing views. May we find language that helps create deeper understandings of the common threads of our shared humanity. And in that spirit, I invite us to share our closing hymn.